I'm sure this works. Everything's good. OK. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. And as people join, we'll just talk about things. So my name is. Hi. Nope, come on in. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Thermo Cosplay. Uh, my human name is Sam. Uh, <laughs> And I've grown up in Tempe, Arizona my entire life. And I'm here to talk to you about the different tools of cosplay. This is only about half of what I use in my regimen. Um, I brought more of the basic items that I think you would need. <laughs> uh, and uh, I am streaming live to Cosfact Live. If you're not familiar with it, it's a cosplay talk show that we do. We talk about local cosplay artists and we visit locations and recommend things for people who are traveling or just trying to get into cosplay. So hello to you. and. Matt, if you can occasionally check the comments, it should be good, but uh, we're good there. Uh, so I've been cosplaying since 2014 in March. I've been cosplaying for 10 years. Uh, so I can't believe it's been 10 years. I don't feel like it's been that long. But in that time, I've won both national and international awards. I've been cosplay guests both nationally and internationally. And um, I have <laughs> experienced my hobby exploding. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, go ahead. It's okay. Um, so sometimes your hobby and your interests in life can just take on lives of their own and you get to follow their fun little path. Um, so today I'm talking about the difference between I've got wig styling tools, power tools, adhesives, all kinds of things. If you have any questions, if you just want to be like, hey, raise your hand, let me know. I would be happy to answer them. Um, so I'm guessing just going to go ahead and get started. Um, one of the very first tools I had as a cosplayer, this was, it was not this nice of a rotary tool. It was not a Dremel. Dremels are expensive. But I started out with a $20 rotary tool from, what was it, Harbor Freight. And these tools are really useful for pretty much any material. You can use it on fabric to weather the edges and make it look like you've got torn edges. And you've been through a crazy fight, wandering a swamp, who knows. You can use it on foam to smooth out the edges so that when you adhere them together, it's a very clean adhesion and you don't have tears because sometimes when you cut, you get rips and tears and things. You can also use it on plastic. You can use it on hardened clay. You can use a rotary tool on pretty much anything. You can cut holes with it. You can smooth things out with it. There's all different kinds of bits and heads with them. So you're welcome to take a look at the different bits and heads that you can put in a rotary tool. And just pass it around. These are really useful as a starter tool to sanding. Hand sanding is excruciating and time consuming. And uh, if you're doing any kind of 3D printing and you're taking a sheet of this and you have to sand all the armor, it's going to take forever. So <laughs> I always recommend having a rotary tool. It does not have to be a Dremel, just something that you can use to smooth out edges to add weathering to materials or to even some of those pictorial bits allow you to cut. So there are some plastics that we use called thermoplastics that when you heat them, some of them adhere, some of them don't. But when you heat them, they become malleable and you can form concave or convex forms for them. Those typically, depending on the thickness of them, you have to use a rotary tool to cut it or you will break into cutting shears. <laughs> so rotary tools are Good for more than just smoothing, they've got a lot of different uses. Uh, and a lot of the ones, when you buy a little kit like this, they have cheaper ones like this too, and they have a description of that telling you what each of the bits does and what you can use it for. So here you go, you guys can see it too. Enjoy, okay. <laughs> um, now, the problem with rotary tools, you can see it's heavy, right? So if you're trying to grip it, I have very small hands. If you're trying to grip it, this may not be the easiest thing for you to use. But for $10 more, if it's not Dremel, I'm warning you guys, Dremel's expensive. You can get this extension. And this just goes right into the top here. And it inserts itself in. And this is called a flex shaft. And the flex shaft allows you to use it like a pencil or a thicker pen. And you have completely out of control. So if you want to add design work into something, like you want to emboss something or carve in crazy brooms or beautiful, delicate filigree, you can do this with the flex shaft. This is also very, very useful. If you guys have questions, I'm talking too fast. If I need to slow down, let me know. I get very excited about this stuff. So, <laughs> yes. Yes, they do. 
Yeah, I think it's like the whole kit. If you if you buy everything, I think it's like forty five dollars. Whereas everything Dremel brand for me. <laughs> no, the reason I have Dremel is I've been cutting through pieces of plastic that are ten millimeters thick. <laughs> you can those off brand ones. Sometimes the power and the motor's not strong enough to get through the really thick stuff. But it's good for standard. Those thick ones. It's, I just make weird stuff sometimes. I make huge hammers that I have no no reason to make, but it's fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, those off brand one at all the I think it's only thirty five dollars for the whole kit. And I agree with you. You do not have to get Dremel. Just any rotary tool is a really good tool to have in your creative uh, kit. What's your name? Thermo cosplay. Oh yeah, that's my actual name. Oh well, that's my costume name. My my actual name is Sam. I say it. Very simple, like Sam likes Angie, but without the wise. <laughs> so, um, but when I level up your sanding game, they can say you, like I said, sometimes you're not doing the small sand or smooth, you're trying to do something a lot bigger. That is where I get into a hand sander. Um, these little guys, <laughs> they, you, they can get them really cheap. This one I only paid $27 for um, because I got it on sale. But these hand sanders cover a lot of space and a little bit of time. I forgot I put the sanding. <laughs> so these go inside of them. And then this is the hand sander itself. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, it collects and filters most of the sanding uh, bits in the back. So it actually, this one has a suction to it. So it's collecting some of it. It doesn't collect all of it, but it does collect some of it. So I would recommend if you're sanding large pieces, do it on a big tarp somewhere. Don't do it inside unless you have ventilation sucking things into another uh, you know, filter system or something like that. But this does have a minor filter system and it pulls some of it. Not all of them have that. Some of them, this is not used as that. Some of this is used as a light or as a balance uh, because it can rubber break. It, it wiggles a lot. And sometimes you just. There's not so having this balance at the end. So, um, it's not very heavy. A little bit goes a really long way. Pay very a close attention to the type of grit that you're using for these because it will chew through material really fast. So you really want to stick to a hand sander if you're doing something large, heavy, thick, maybe something with wood, thicker plastic, um, plaster. It's okay. I dropped stuff on the floor. That doesn't hold me. Um, but stuff like that is probably the best bet for a hand sander. Um, any questions on sanding before I kind of get to some other tools? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Safety equipment. I should talk about that real fast. When you are using any of these tools, regardless if it's paint, adhesives, sanding, whatever it might be, most people, this is a respirator. If you're sanding, I highly recommend you get a respirator, not a paint respirator, an actual MSA Safety Works respirator because it is graded for both particulates and chemicals. Yes, it is an expensive investment. So you can just buy masks that do the same thing that are temporary and only last one or two times. But if you're going to be doing this a lot, I recommend saving up and investing in one of these that has particulates and chemicals that it can handle. Um, you usually will. Uh, have to replace these every six months to a year, depending on how often that you are using the respirator. You will know that it doesn't work if you put it on your face and you breathe in, and it's really hard to breathe in. That means the filter is almost done and you need to replace it. Because sometimes I don't use this one as much. <laughs> I have another respirator that I use because I paint more often than I sand. So this one I only have to replace every one to one and a half years, but I can tell when I breathe in, I'm like, I can't breathe at all. This is done. I need to get a new one. And don't try to force your breath through it, you will pass out. Yeah. I noticed that too when you say tools for cosplay, like um, what kind of tools tools do with the cosplay? So for um for this one, for instance, if I'm spray painting um like armor or if I'm painting uh like a sword, I would be using this. Oh. Yeah. So there's all kinds of, and I can mention, I'll mention some examples of like why I use these tools too. You know, I was talking about sanding earlier, right? So you would want to wear a respirator, but if you don't want your glasses scratched and you don't want your eyes damaged, I also recommend safety glasses. These are cheap. They only cost me a dollar. 
But they work really well. I have others that are more expensive for things that um, I use when I'm grinding metal. I get a much higher grade safety glass because the uh, sparks from the metal will melt through these. So you'll need something with a little bit of chalker. Um, but safety glasses, a respirator, or a mask that protects your lungs. And I always recommend either some kind of disposable nitrile gloves. I say, I say uh, nitrile because it tends to handle heat better than other gloves. Latex, I'm also severely allergic to, so I can't touch that. Um, but if you don't want to do that, for $5, you can get these mechanics gloves that are stretchy, and they have a neoprene coating on the bottom of them. And this protects your hands from heat and from chemicals because the neoprene rejects the adhesives. I've, I've had paint and adhesives on this, and I've just washed it right off with no problem. So we'll go through all that. But yeah, um, I can, uh, I'm gonna put this over here for now and I can put it away later because. Jessica says, hi, Cool Gamer. Hi, Cool Gamer. Hi, Jess. Um, so, sanding, you can, like I said, you can use it for multiple things. You can use it for um, creating, maybe you're wanting to create a wizard staff and you want to create cool wooden grooves in it because you just bought like a large dowel and it's boring, but you want to make it look real weather worn and like hold it off of a tree. That's what you can use a Dremel and hand sander for. Um, you can also use it for big chest plates or pauldrons or hip pieces. It can be used on, depending on the grit, it can be used on wood, metal, plastic, um, and most foam. You'll just want to be careful at the spot foam that you're using a much slower speed on things because it eats <laughs> through foam. And I may have felt once or twice, thankfully while wearing gloves, been sanding something and ate right through into my finger. <laughs> but I had gloves on, so it was okay. That's why safety is important. <laughs> um, that's why I recommend the, recommend the mechanics gloves because they are meant for heavy wear and tear. And they're usually five to 10 bucks. Uh, I, these are children's mechanics gloves because I have tiny hands. <laughs> but yeah, but they're, what are these ones? These are called the Gorilla Grips. And they're perfect. They work really, really well. Plus, you'll see that it comes up pretty high. It comes up about mid, mid arm. And that's protecting you from any potential fallout because sometimes even when you're not sanding metal, you can still get the material heated up so much that it will melt and fly off. And I've had it land on my arm before. Like I don't know if you've had hot wood or plastic on your arm, but it's very uncomfortable. So when you are crafting with anything that requires heavy heavy machinery, wear clothing as well that will protect your body. Um, let's see here. Yeah. So Yes. So the extension for the Dremel tool does make it make it go smoother. It actually has uh, more control of the speed as well. And then because you have this button here, it turns off even if you have this turned on. So you have more dual action control basically when using the flex shaft for a Dremel. Um, it's it also comes with different bits, and it has a lot of recommendations on the back of how to use settings to ensure different materials work better for you. Um, that's, I, uh, it's my new one, <laughs> by the way, <workout. laughs> you will go through things again, 10 years of this. Um, I had the same heat gun for eight years and then two years ago, mine died and I was like, fairly well, <laughs> and I had to get another one. Um, so we'll move on. I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and since I'm talking about a heat gun, um, a lot of the tools in cosplay, especially things called thermoplastics, which is what my namesake comes from. Thermoplastic comes from thermoplastics. As you may have guessed, thermal relating to heat or um, or the, the you know dynamic friction when, when a lot of pressure or vibrations are added to something uh, allows you to make certain things malleable. So thermoplastics, some of them come in an adhesive form called warfla, um, or there is all kinds of different types of warfla, and then some of them are uh, a thermoplastic that has no adhesion in it. Um, it's the plastic that you would see on billboards. Those are considered thermoplastics because they can uh, expand and contract with the heat without deforming completely. And that is where you would need a heat gun. Um, I also use a heat gun sometimes when I'm sewing and I've got a fray on something and I need my, I put like a fray check on it and I need it to cure fast so that it will stay together when I'm sewing it. That works too, okay, that's too close. But heat guns uh, are used to pull up um, final melonium force of so linoleum, I can speak. Uh, 
these <laughs> they can get upwards of I think 300 degrees depending on the type that you've purchased. So uh, rule of thumb: never put your hand near the end of a heat gun ever. Uh, I had when you're crafting, be aware of your space. Make sure your pets are outside of the room or not in the backyard with you. Uh, make sure little siblings are not running around. And I see a little of my brother six foot six that ran by and I told him, watch out. And he pulled away three layers of skin. Um, <laughs> so be very mindful of where this is. But this can be used for a lot. Uh, if you're trying, say you've got a 3D printed object and you've got some kind of a seam and you're trying to seal it and smooth it out, you can heat it with a heat gun and you can use a metal sculpting tool and smooth it out. And then you'll have a nice clean seam won't have that edge. You can do the same thing with foam on the edges of foam. Sometimes it get like tattered and shredded. You take a heat gun to it, it will melt it all back into place. So this is used as a high point melting or say you've got something that you hot glued together um, and it's just not staying warm enough, warm enough for you to manipulate it. You can take a heat gun on a low setting and keep manipulating the hot glue to do what you want it to do until you're ready for it to fully cure. So there's a lot of good ways you can use a heat gun. They don't really come much smaller than this. I mean, a little bit smaller, but they're pretty big. <laughs> so they are a tool that takes up a lot of space, but I will say that they're not very expensive. My very first heat gun was only 20 bucks and it lasted me eight years. Um, so it was $20 well invested. Uh, and I made a lot of different outfits. I've made armor with them. Like I said, I've taken um, like a uh, faux leather and I've melted it to make it look like I got hit by a fireball or something and it scorched some of the clothing. Uh, so you can do some really, really interesting things with heat guns. All right. This all right together. Ceiling. Yep, ceiling foam. That is one thing. If you are planning, most people start off their armor or their, their, their custom goods using EVA foam or craft foam. And if you are doing that, what most people don't know is the EVA foam and craft foam or the anti heat for uh, the formats that people will see that you stand on when you're working in your garage, those are what's called closed cell foam. The problem with closed cell foam is the way it's manufactured, it gets bubbles in that process. So if you don't preheat your foam before you begin drawing on it, you could potentially change the pattern of your armor after cutting out and then heating and forming it because it will warp. It will also release those bubbles and sometimes it shrinks because when you're releasing the extra air, the, the material is finally collapsing in on itself. So before you use any craft foam, high density foam, HD foam, EVA foam, whatever it is, heat it first with the heat gun, let it completely heat up and completely cool, and then go ahead and start with your pattern and draft and cut it out because you know, basically it's like pre shrinking, pre shrinking uh, cotton. You need to pre shrink your foam. <laughs> so, and the heat gun is what you would use for that. Please, please, please do not use your ovens or your stoves. Um, HD foam, EVA foam, and uh, craft foam release a toxic gas, and this gas has killed birds. It can make children very sick, and it can cause illicit COPD symptoms in humans if you are not wearing masks. So if you are using foam, it can be safe as long as you're in a ventilated area, you have a mask on, and there's no other creature in the room that's good. <laughs> so just make sure you're, you're taking precautions. It's also one of the easiest materials to use um, because any adhesive pretty much works on foam. So you can get started pretty easily learning how to draft uh, patterns. I haven't talked about this yet, but I'm going to bring it over. Two ways that I like to draft patterns. The two cheapest things, cling wrap and tin foil. So cling wrap, you can just take this stuff and you can wrap it all around yourself. I will say if you are wrapping it around your body, be mindful. One. Make sure you have surgical scissors to cut yourself out after you wrap yourself up and take yourself up. So I like to use painter's tape and then the first to run out and then painter's tape to draw patterns on myself and get familiar with drafting. Um, but surgical scissors. I have a scar on my side because I thought that my sewing scissors were safe enough to cut myself out and I cut open my side. So surgical scissors because they have a flat head that glides up along the skin and guarantees you will not be cut. <laughs> They're also sharp enough to get through the saran wrap and the painter's tape. So this is a great way to build patterns that need to be larger. If you need something that's just a little bit smaller, you can take aluminum foil and just wrap it around your arm, draw on it with a Sharpie, cut it real fast and lay it down. Pretty easy. 
And the, I mean, it will wrinkle a little bit, but if you're just making a quick pattern, that's all you need. What I like to do after I've found a pattern that I know works for me, I like to transfer it to either butcher paper or uh, uh, muslin or patternies. And patternies is a pattern drafting material that's actually made for sewists, the seamstresses and tailors. And it's super useful because then I can just use that pattern forever until my body changes. <laughs> so great ways to make patterns and aluminum foil and cling wrap, you can get at dollar stores forever. So yeah. So you're using the paper tape and the sort of wrap. So, uh, so for uh, I use it for any pattern that I need. Um, I've made sewing patterns from it. I've made crown patterns from it. But I'll show you how I do this. With, when you're wrapping with this, I usually don't like to do. This. Most people like I I do the lay down method and then I keep laying and laying. Most people and this works too. But understand when you wrap like this, when you start wrapping really tight. The problem here is you're starting to shrink your pattern because you're trying to get it tight to stick. Right? It likes to it likes to slip and slide. Right? So just be mindful if you go like that and you start wrapping around that you are going to make it much tighter. So that's why I wrap mine loose and I rely on the tape to make it a little bit snugger. Um, so let me show you guys how to do that real fast. So this is just loosely wrapped around. This is how not to make a pattern. And then this is how to make a pattern. So I'm gonna start with how not to make a pattern. Uh, how not to make a pattern, you just take it and you don't go like this. This is what most people do. Right, exactly. And uh, I, I didn't go as tight as I could. <laughs> I got one stuck on here one time. Um, anyway, this is how you should be making patterns. And you can use much thicker tape. Like this is too small. I ran out of my really thick tape. But I just take stri strips of it. And then I start laying it over. And you'll notice that it's conforming better. Like it's taking a much more convex shape. So you do put it though over the entire, every area of the wrap? Yes, completely. It covers all areas of the saran wrap. And then I'll just go and I'll grab like any kind of Sharpie or any, any drawing implement that you think will be dark enough on this. And I uh, draw out draw a pattern. And if it's something that you can't just put, pick up off your head or off your body, you have to cut yourself out of it. That's the sort of scissors. But for this, you know, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's um, you're being useful. Uh, that's the best way to make patterns, and it's it's very cheap. It's just the ran round and paper tape. Um, you can use duct tape because duct tape patterns do last longer. But the problem with duct tape is it's much stickier, and so it will gum up your scissors faster. So you'll have to use some kind of either um, nail polish remover or 99% uh, IPA isopropyl alcohol to remove the gem. Okay. Um. So aside from these ones, it's like I've got so many tools. <laughs> um. We mentioned we'll talk about cutting implements because we were talking about uh, cutting away patterns. So scissors are important in your toolbox. If you don't like scissors, you can use utility knives. If you don't like utility knives, you can use an exacto knife. Or any kind of small crafting knife. If you don't like those, um, there are safety scissors you can use to remove things. Um, you can also use something, my favorite tool, dangerous, but favorite, <laughs> is this little unassuming creature right here. It's a soldering iron. But this soldering iron has an exacto blade attachment. It is a hot knife. So you heat it up to about mid level and you carve right through plastic right through foam, and you get the cleanest cut possible. It smells terrible, so please wear a mask. <laughs> Again, that off-gassing can be really, really dangerous. But a hot knife is probably one of the most useful tools, and a soldering iron as well, because soldering iron can be used to pull in edges, like I mentioned, the, the, the uh, heat gun. If you don't need something huge, because the heat gun is rather large, and you just need a small surface repair, you can use a soldering iron for a hot knife. This is the little piece. The little piece that's in there. Um, sometimes I can I use it too because it's one that's like a screw bit, and I just press screws, 
into my foam and it looks like I have fake screws that screwed my armor in. So you can use it to create interesting products as well. Um, yes. Do you, so do you like that? I do like the hot knife for cutting better than a Dremel, but I do like a Dremel better for adding details and smoothing out seams. Uh, I also, I will say, so we talked about using a Dremel to smooth out seams. I cheat. No, no, no. It's fine. Uh, everything's coming at different times. Don't worry about it. I sort of cheat when it comes to foam or wood. I hate smoothing out seams with a Dremel because it's really time consuming and you sometimes have to keep re gluing them together. So I use quick seal, the plumbing silicone, <laughs> and I put it over the edge. I let it cure for 12 hours and then I gently sand it and there's no trace of the seam at all. <laughs> and it's skin safe so you can just squeeze it out and smooth it over and then wipe away any excess of the wet paper towel and you're pretty much done. It is really cheap. <laughs> And I've had this for two years. <laughs> Quick seal. Yeah, is it any kind of plumbing silicone is <laughs> very useful. It's the stuff like, you know, when you've got like a drain that just has a little bit of a leak, and you just need to kind of clean it. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's very useful. Uh, it's a tool and material simultaneously, right? So, very useful. Now, one thing that you will, even if you're not sculpting, I always recommend having a few sculpting tools. I mentioned that you're going to be cleaning up edges and seams a lot when you're making things. Um, and then also sometimes I've used some of these sculpting tools to weather some, uh, some like vests and clothes or add holes into like leggings or sleeves to give it just aging. So these tools are very useful. A lot of them have very sharp edges, so be careful. Um, but even if you just buy some of the wooden ones, or this, this is the tool I use the most. It is a silicone smoother that you use on clay to smooth it out once you're at your final stage. And it works really well for smoothing out seams whenever you're trying to get a really nice finish. Um, you can use it on thermoplastics because it's silicone. You can use it on foam, you can use it on 3D prints, nothing sticks to it. <laughs> silicone only sticks to silicone, that is the first. So if you're using silicone, it might stick to it. But I will pass around to some of the sculpting tools. So the, the, the stuff left on it is just black slow. So. What's it called? Um, it's called, it's just, it's a silicone smoother and you'll find it in any sculpting area. Kit. Oh, it's a sculpting kit. Um, I've been sculpting for a long time, just little small things. I make masks. I've made like, I made a full silicone mask for uh, Thancreos from Mass Effect. <laughs> and I'm actually currently working on another crazy alien build that these tools will be used for. So I always like having them. I can't tell you how many times I've had problems where I'm trying to get, say, I've got um, a sewing project where I have to have glue on a silicone band so that it's a stretchy skirt or a pair of leggings. Using that to hold it down while I'm getting the glue to seal, great. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but yeah, sculpting tools are also really useful. And the, this is just building up your arsenal. You don't have to have all of this, but pay attention to what projects you're trying to focus on. Do you want to be a special effects maker? Do you want to be an armor crafter? Do you want to be someone who sews? What are you trying to work on? And those are the tools that you'll want to focus on first. So I've talked a lot about um, prop making, armor making, kind of the heavier pieces. What I haven't mentioned, and this is the one that's probably started everything, is a sewing machine. This thing is heavy. Um, so this is my sewing machine. It is the Seeger Heavy Duty Industrial. I hate computerized sewing machines because if you have to get them repaired, you have to go to a specialist, and it's $150 twice a year to get it cleaned, repaired, and reprogrammed. On the other hand, if you use a fully mechanical machine like this, you can add grease and oil to the gears and that's it. That's all you need to do. Occasionally, you might have to take it to get the timing belt serviced. Uh, it has a timer inside of it. So if you notice that your stitches aren't going straight or it's kind of like skipping occasionally, you might have to get that reserviced, but that's $50 and that's it. So I recommend, honestly, for, for beginners, I recommend an industrial 
The computerized are what? About $200 for a sewing machine. The industrial is $125. It is heavy. It is very heavy. I would pass this around, but it is heavy. Uh, this is about 15 pounds of sewing machine, uh, which is why when I carried this thing in, I was like, oh, I forgot to put this thing in. Then I had all the other stuff in the bin, too. But this is probably your most useful. And it has, it's okay. it has a cuddle. And it has a bunch of sewing, like a ball ball walk around. But it also has a piece of suspension to the side, too. And you can hear those all the people who sit next to you. So the fact that it has different stitching makes it But you can't tell me if I have sewing strips and people are sitting in one of the or push strips. People are feeling like throwing the shoulder or something. A lot of the times, people will get rid of the sewing machine, not realizing it just needs a minor repair. So, I, my first sewing machine was a brother's sewing machine that was also industrial. <laughs> I got it free. $35 in the first store, and all it needed was a new belt. The person said it didn't work, they just never serviced it. So, <laughs> sometimes you get lucky if someone doesn't know how to take care of the machine. But, sewing machines are, if you're wanting to be more of um, a costume cosplayer that doesn't have as much props, that's something you'll want to lean towards. If you can't afford a sewing machine, there are alternatives. Now, warning, uh, so there are, there are alternatives. There are things like, this is, this is the only piece I have left. It's so cool. This is a double stick cosplay tape called Cosplot. It works on fabric. It adheres fabric so well that it's like having a liquid stitch. Only you can touch it with your hand. Now, if you get too much oil on it, it will come apart. So be very careful with how quickly how much you touch. It has um you peel this off, stick it down, and then peel it up so you're not touching it too often. I have used it to put together a sequin skirt because I did not feel like taking off when you sew sequin skirts, you have to take the sequins off and then sew it together, and then sew all the sequins back on individually by hand. I didn't want to do that. So <laughs> I just lifted the sequins, put the Cosmon tape underneath it, laid the two seams together. Then I took this Cosmon reinforcer. This is a seam reinforcer. It works on fabric, plastic, foam. I have yet to find something that doesn't work on. It even worked on some metal pieces I was working on. Now, I wouldn't say it's going to hold a heavy metal piece together, but it was like accessories that I just wanted to have, like, like a cool gem here or a pen. It worked really well. And you just cut a little strip and you just lay one strip down. I call it I, I call it uh, fabric duct tape without actually using duct tape, and it's machine washable. Don't just just put it on delicate and then hit, like hang dry it. But you don't have to sew if you're not ready to sew. You can also use tacky glue or fabric glues, but understand that it's going to slow you down a lot. They typically have 24 to 48 hour curing time. And in Arizona, our heat can cause it to separate. So just be mindful of that. Uh, yeah. So it's also great to have like, a first aid kit. Like, yes. Stuff. Costal first aid kits are really useful. Mm -hmm. If you do have a sewing machine and it is industrial, I mentioned grease and oil. This is it. Like, it was $3 for the oil and $3 for the grease. So. I always have those in my kit, so I can touch up my sewing machine. Um, building patterns, one thing that's really important is you'll need the ability to, obviously, after you've created your pattern, you'll need to transfer it to fabric. You don't want to use ends or sharpies to transfer to fabric. So I recommend either using Taylor's chalk, which is kind of like a waxy chalk-like substance, substance, or uh, they come out with these new Madame Sew so chalk pens where they've taken the powder of the chalk and they put it inside of a roller and I can I just draw on myself. But you can just use this and wipe it away and it's gone. So it's really useful for transferring patterns to fabric. And the great thing about that sewing is it's on a rotating base. So there's nothing that's going to potentially catch the fabric. It's a very smooth rotating base and it works really well. Any questions? But yeah, go ahead. What are your questions? So one thing that I've had a lot of success with, and I'm sure for experience, is have you used um, 
Yeah, so stitch witch is essentially what we also call a, a, a fabric bond. There's, there's all different kinds of things. Stitch witch is an actual like, main brand for it. Yeah. But it, it, what it is, it's, it's, it's like, it's similar to like a heating bond. Uh, so you put it down and you, you would lay both seams together. You usually have to use clips or pens. That's one thing I want to talk about when you are putting it together. Um, but if you're using uh, a heat bond, you don't want to use uh, pens that can potentially glue them into your fabric. So what I recommend doing if you are using a heat bond and you're not sewing with a sewing machine is you take these little fabric clips and you clip at different ends and then you just iron between. So you are going to have to, if you're not going to use, and I'll pass this around to <laughs> the magnet is, is still in a little bit from here. Uh, but if you're, if you're not going to sew your, your costumes together, um, at least not in a traditional sense where you're using a needle and thread, uh, you will definitely want fabric clips instead of fabric pins. It keeps everything together better. And they're, they, they last a really long time and they have different sizes too. Um, you also want to maybe have pattern weights or just take a couple of rocks from outside to keep the fabric in position because sometimes fabric likes to flip. The only problem I say with um, heat and bond or stitch witch or anything where it's heat that's activating adhesion is there's only uh, natural fibers that seems to work well with. If it's a polyester, you'll eventually have splitting. Right. It will eventually right. come apart. Okay. So you're going to only be able to use this on natural fibers. Because the natural fibers can melt in a cure. You can use, okay, correction, you can use it on other fibers. It will not last very long. I had, I, there was a Princess Leia that used the same thing, put together her skirt at a convention. She walked through the door, the heat from outside had been really bad. She'd been outside in the line all day long, walked through the door. The wind from the AC kicked her skirt up and it just fell up her right in front of everybody and she was naked. So, <laughs> and it was because she used. That's where I would recommend, hard. honestly, going to the cause bond. Go with the yeah. double stick tape. It handles heat way better than stitch which can. Cool. And it works on both natural and uh, fabricated fibers. Yes. So I'm thinking that you would recommend the person test drive the cause Yes, please test drive your cosplays. You know what I like to do? I like to do chores in my cosplay. I'm like, I gotta do laundry. So I put my costume on, I do laundry, I feed my cat, maybe I, I walk around my house sweeping or mopping. Sometimes I'll go grocery shopping in my cosplay to see if it can handle the elements. <laughs> and yeah, you'll definitely want to test your costume out before you wear it as a con, because I have seen a lot of naked people. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I only, it was only ten dollars for like a hundred of them on Amazon. Really? Yeah, and you can get them now at more, at more stores. Like I've seen them at Joanne's, Bobby Lobby's. I've seen a couple of them at Michael's, but they are amazing. <laughs> um, I also um, I mentioned the pattern weight. This is a magnet and a pattern weight. Please don't put this near any electronic device. Wreck <laughs> your device. This is a very strong magnet. But I like using magnets when I'm sewing on my sewing machine because I can put this down, and you'll notice it has like a little. So I guess here, but it has like this little edge around here, and that's where the fabric slips under so that it can't move any further over. So you never get it slipping over. It stays right against the edge. You get a nice thin sewing edge. So I love every sewing machine has that metal plate because so you have to access the bottom feed, and I'm like, yes, <laughs> very useful. Yeah. That is um, Taylor's chalk or Taylor's wax. The wax is for. I use the wax for like fabrics that are super shiny, like thick leathers or real leather, anything that has kind of a texture to it. And then the tailor's chalk is useful for pretty much anything else. But if it's got like a really shiny um, kind of finish on it, the wax seems to work better to draw. If the powder just falls off that really high sheet, and then you're like, where did that draw? It's gone. <laughs> so, um, let me see. I have I don't think there's any questions. Oh, no. yeah. Okay, we're good there. Hey, I just, okay. All right. Um. Okay. So I've gone through like sewing, and I've gone through sanding, and I've talked about cutting. Um. <laughs> let's see here. What time are we at right now, Matt? We got twenty minutes. Oh wow. 
That's it. Okay. <laughs> what is left? That's still three minutes. Dear God. Okay. Um, <laughs> I thought I had more time. All right. So you might see this little special box. I mentioned um, scissors. Each scissor has its own use. Never mix your paper scissors with your foam scissors and with your fabric scissors. Each one of them must have a specific use. So I have this is like soft fabric scissor. <laughs> These are my heavier fabric scissors. This is when I need a really crazy curve and I don't feel like trying to make my wrist do it with a straight scissor. So I can just I push this little guy down and I just cut them in, in, in a curve. Yeah, it's like a pizza cutter. And then these are pinky shoes. So if you have fabric and has a really bad habit of fraying, you cut with these, they will not fray. Um, I will say that you go through these faster because you can't sharpen them. Um, the reason I brought these up is because I have a recommendation for anybody that has sewing scissors or foam scissors or any kind of scissor, get a, get a scissor sharpener. Um, they are really easy to use. You open the scissor. There's two slots. You slide the scissor in. You go out it's like this. And you use it as many times as you need until you cut and it works beautifully. It also frees up any like if you say you use some adhesive to like keep something in place, it cleans all that up here. We're gonna show so it's full cleaning and sharpening. Um, scissors are scissors. I, I mean, I'll pass this one around. Just be careful with pushing the buttons. You want to use the primary blade and it's very sharp. But I, I figure everyone's seen a pair of scissors. <laughs> so they're just regular scissors. These ones, the reason I have these, the ones that have a little bit of a curve. Um, so if you don't have that machine scissor, if you have a scissor that has this kind of angle to it, it makes it easier to cut curves. So recommend always having one pair that has that kind of 45 degree angle to it. And I guess I could pass the pink and shirt. I don't know if anybody's ever seen one of these. <laughs> It has a little try. It cuts basically cuts little triangles to prevent it from shape, uh, from uh, fraying. <laughs> now, has anybody? You, you see, I also brought this for another reason. You see the? I forgot about this. You see the little pretty gems on here? Have they done any kind of like embellishing the gems? Yeah. Um, have you ever tried to do it by hand? How tiny they are? They just fall over the room. You're like, that's not the position I meant you in. Yeah. So there's a. This is the. <laughs> The cheapest tool I probably ever purchased. So, one end. Oops, wait. Hold it wrong way. There you go. One end has this waxy substance on it. And then the other end, so you can put the gem on the waxy substance and drop it into the tube. And what you can do, the great thing about this, is it flips upwards. One end. So, pick up the gem, put it down. And it's a flat that just knocks the off. There's two different sizes, whether it's a big or small. But does this part of the room is bigger than the gem? Oh, that thing is right to this part. Oh, this yeah. Yeah, part. Mm -hmm. I got the little bit so hold it. But it's it's essentially a gym applicator, and it was only like three dollars. And I have used it so many times. I laid over three thousand fake running stones for a Tomatilla costume with you know the, the big crab from Moana. <laughs> And it was nerve wracking trying to do it by hand. But, and I just randomly found this at Joanne's, and I was like, Joanne, I'm going to try this. And it worked beautifully. So, yes. So when I pass it around, there's a sticky side. And the sticky side picks up the gym in the perfect position, exactly what you want it to be in. So you like, you touch the top part of the gym. Then wherever the blue is, you lay it down and you use the plastic bit to knock the gym off the sticky side. And it's the perfect masturbation. Yeah. Yeah. Only instead of having to use your hands, which, so I, I've got a neurological condition and my hands off and on will usually do this. I'm doing really good at focusing right now and not letting them shake, but my hands are usually like this. And so um, when I don't have enough focus or I'm tired and I can't control that, that helps so much. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for that one. Yeah. Even though it's like the new one from it, no. it's pretty clean. It's really clean. Have you, you know what a kneaded eraser is? That's all that's in there. It's just a kneaded eraser. Okay. And it's just picking up the gems. And so it doesn't leave any residue because kneaded erasers are meant to pick up residue from things. Okay. So, yeah, um, it. when I, I laughed when I saw it, I was like, wait, they just put a kneaded eraser inside of the gym applicator. This is brilliant. <laughs> like, I could have made one of these 
blah, blah, blah. Um, and then if like if at some point it gets too dirty and you don't like it anymore, you can squeeze more out and you can just pick right off and you've got a clean application. So say you accidentally <clears throat> rolled it too close to your paint. <laughs> <laughs> Clean it off pretty easy. I have done that many times. Uh, one thing, uh, is there any, like, I have a lot of different tools. So, since we're coming out of the last like 10 15 minutes, are there any projects that you're interested in doing that you're not sure, sure what tool you need or you're trying to figure something out? And you're like, what, what can I use for this? I mean, I know that I just I have a lot. So, yes. Because I know so too, like whenever there's like a lot of fabric and a lot of um, needling or something, yeah. but at the clothes, like if I wanted to do like some of those walking clothes stuff, mm -hmm. like I'm happy to like um, make costumes or something. So if you're trying to do, say you're trying to make a sewing costume, if you don't know how to draw your own patterns, I highly recommend going to Joanne or the Michaels or Bobby Lobby and buying pre made patterns. I will warn that creamy patterns don't fit everybody's height. I am much taller than all the patterns that are out there. So I've learned to make my own. Um, what I recommend if you are concerned about using pre-bought patterns is having a friend come over, getting into some just curly clothes, wrapping yourselves in that saran wrap, taping yourself up and creating a body double of yourself, right? So you can cut yourself out, you can stuff it full of polyfill, like the, the really cheap, affordable stuff that they put in pillows, but it works really well when things are fluffy. And you can take it off and you can have a duct tape dummy of yourself. And then you can learn the pattern. You can, take duct, you can put a painter's tape on top of the duct tape, peel it off really easy, and create your own patterns. And then that way you'll have to visualize where you're doing things. What I learned to do patterns through was I went to thrift stores and I bought clothing that mimicked the style I was looking for. I took it apart, seam it fit, and learned how to lay it together. Kept taking it apart, putting it back together, taking it apart, putting it back together. So I learned how. Fabric with those. And so, recommend going to thrift and just getting a cheap shirt, cheap pair of pants, maybe a jacket, taking it apart, seeing the logic behind it, and labeling it as you go. Yeah, so that's a great way to start. Pattern drafting, which is complex. <laughs> yes. Or your pattern is kind of like what you want. Lay it out. And if you want big, wide sleeves, then you cut the fabric big, wide. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so. Yeah, you can, and that's the thing too, because a lot of <coughs> clothing has really, really tight sleeves. All you have to do is just widen the end. So literally, just widen that end, and then it's like it's like a big triangle. It's like oh, it's almost like a, it's a, it's kind of a rhombus shape, where it's really big but then smaller at the bottom. Yeah, and that's how you get like a really wide, 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 uh, kind of I think it's like a Renaissance sleeve is what they call it, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any questions? Anything else? I'm gonna keep going. If not, just yes. Okay. You know what? Um, the only other tools I'm going to mention. If you use hot glue in Arizona, there's only one hot glue you should be using. The Gorilla Glue Hot Glue Sticks. Oh, they are the only one. Does that work? <laughs> RG Rex Hot Glue. So I like to use the Gorilla Glue Hot Glue Sticks. If you cannot afford these, there is a trick. Wear a mask. Wear gloves. Before you put your hot glue down, put a little bit of E6000 down, then put the hot glue down, E6000 and hot glue mix, and create a very permanent bond. But it's toxic. So, mask and gloves. <laughs> so, that is very important. If you were a 3D printer and you got tired of using a, uh, was it, cyan or acrylic, basically a really heavy duty super glue, which if you're not like I've had this super glue rip open my gloves because it's so powerful with this adhesion. I recommend this little tool called Bonnet. It's very cheap. You can get it on Amazon. It is a fast curing LED activated resin. It comes out of this little pin tip. It comes out of this pin tip. You put it on either side wherever the seam is. You put the seams together. You activate the light at the very end. If my hand has stopped shaking, it's okay. So you go over the seam. For about 10 seconds and test it and you're probably done. I have put together so much 3D print items, like so many different ones using this, and it works on TPU and PLA and ABS. So, because it's just resin. It's essentially, it, it's a bond, B-O-N-D-I-C. So, yeah. 
if you guys want to take a look at that too. Awesome. And that's um, your, it's not proper to the skin. Don't don't inhale it. It's resin. But the way that they've made it, because it's uh, inactive until you hit it with a uh, specific UV light, you're safe. So to get out your skin and wash it off, you're okay. Unless you work under you know, in, in interesting lights, <laughs> or you're working outside, then it might auto keep those work outside with this. You need to be indoors with um, But I think that's, uh, I guess the other tool is if you're working with leather, make sure you have leather shears, like actual leather scissors, because they're a lot stronger and you won't break the, <laughs> the head off your, I've broken my scissors so many times trying to cut leather. But about leather shoes, and then if you are interested in anything that has to look with leather, whether you're adding in rivets or you're adding in buttons that have to be pressed together, where you have to take it and tap with the hammer, you can get one of these instead. And it has it been rotated, and oh yeah, but yeah, I forgot. I forgot the tool that the app that opens this up. But you can rotate the heads different sizes, and you can add rivets, you can add the buttons that still. There's all kinds of things with this tool. It's a lot easier to use than. Trying to line it up and then put it in there. Um, it also works for uh, grommets. But I think those are all the tools that you can use. Definitely need to cover. Yes. What is the addition for the number of ingredients? Uh, e6000. It's the letter E and the number 6000. And then you said you had some general questions. Uh, yes. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. So, first question is if your color again is possible to say go to the red thing, but what's like your time frame if you have to put something in there? So, so if, you're, if you're planning a costume, <laughs> the big thing I like to think about is how many pieces are involved. So, if you have a costume that it's just a dress, you probably only need, I'd say, four to six weeks out to make a dress. But if you have a cosplay that's 16 pieces, you probably need six months out so that you have the time to get the materials, you have the time to get the patterns, you have the time to let things cure, um, and then you have time to make any tailoring or adjustments, right? So the average costume I would say is about three to four months before the convention that you should get started. But I have a costume I'm working on right now that I've been working on simply collecting the materials for over six months, just collecting materials for six months because some of the materials were on back order for so long that I had to wait for them. So you really make sure that you're doing your research at least six months in advance. But I see the average is probably uh, three to four months at max. Yeah. Well, isn't there also that you would add in creativity time? You have a general rule idea you need the detail to formulate in your mind you yeah if you if you don't if you haven't if you don't already have your creative vision you probably want to start a few more weeks out before the six months because <laughs> uh, creative vision can get tricky um, especially if your body type isn't what's considered like a standard among patterns then you'll really might you might have to get creative with things so yeah yes uh, and also Yes, I usually test drive it a week before the convention because I can typically what happens is minor, minor repairs. But if it's something big like an armor or a large prop, make sure you test it two weeks out. Um, I had a prop that I had thought had fully cured. It didn't. And the head of it fell off three days before the con. And thank goodness it was the middle of Arizona summer because everything cures really fast in the middle of our summer, but I was able to reattach the head of this hammer and get it cured in time. Um, so don't be like me and wait till a few days before when it comes to big props. Test those out a few weeks in advance. And also if you're test driving it, you more than what you're doing at a convention. If you're doing one of the big fucking things on other things, then you kind of know it's going to survive. Yeah, well, and if you're testing it, you're also figuring out, am I going to catch on doorways? Can I use the bathroom in this? Can I eat in this? Can I sit down in this? How far can I lean down? Can I lean over? Like, there are things that you may not consider until you put it on. Yeah, well, I had a wig that was five pounds, and I thought I was going to be okay. After wearing it an hour, I realized my neck was going to hurt too much, so I added, like, support through uh, thermoplastic. That kind of connected with one of my back collars. So my shoulders ended up bearing some of the weight of the wig. Can I walk through a 
doorway is covered. Yes. Because, because That's why I go grocery shopping with it sometimes. <laughs> I will say the biggest thing is try to go on public once with it before you go to a convention. If you've got big pieces, see if you can even fit in a bathroom stall. Because I had a costume I could not fit in the stall, so I brought a handler with me, and we had a spare bag. And I took off two of my overskirts, and I had opaque tights underneath so I wouldn't be naked. I took off my shoulder pieces and my hat so that I could fit in a bathroom stall. <laughs> so just I mean, because they're usually narrow. So yes. Uh, yeah, I would say the standard tools like the basic tools, heat gun, Grimmel, um, some scissors, um, basic pattern materials and CT equipment, you're probably looking at close to $100. And I mean, that's utilizing dollar stores, thrift stores, um, and subs. But if you're not, if you're gonna go with main, like mainstream items, you're gonna go with the best. If you're looking at close to 200, maybe $300, especially if you're throwing in a sewing machine and you're gonna add another 150 automatic on top of that, $100 to $200. So um, if you want to become a crafter, um, that's actually what I ended up doing. I wanted to become more of a maker. So I had um, a series where I offered rewards and I uh, did like a raffle and I ended up raising $500 to get all the tools that I needed because this is only half of what I have. So, so I'm speaking of the majority of the money that comes from fabric. Yes, fabric and um, thermoplastics. Thermoplastics are, well, Citra is inexpensive. You can get a six foot by nine foot sheet of Sintra, which is a non adhesive thermostat. You'd have to put your own adhesive on it, thermoplastic, from um, say layered plastics, which is just up the road from here, for uh, $25. They they have leftovers from their billboards and they're always trying to get rid of it, and they will sell it to you for like $25. <laughs> and it's a six foot by nine foot sheet lasts a really long time. Now, if it's thermoplastic, a uh, what is it, 53 by 32 inch sheet is $85. So it can vary depending on the material. I would say the cheapest materials tend to be poly cottons or cotton blends. Um, and then uh, oddly enough, a lot of the um, athletic spandex tends to be inexpensive as well because it's become so prevalent. Uh, next question is in terms of the purely uh, these types of materials, you have a certain uh, place that you go, stores, outlets? Yes. So procuring materials varies. In Arizona, um, when it comes to fabric, I tend to hang out with um, SAS, um, which is a fabric wholesaler. They've got locations in Phoenix, um, Peoria, and Tempe. Uh, and then I also go to Joanne. Joanne is really good for like the heavier fabrics, and some of they do sell cosplay fabrics now as well. If I want, I, I, I love stretch fabric. I love stretch fabric, and I love unusual leather. Tandy leather is great for leathers, and they have really good deals. They always have sales going on. Stretch fabrics, my favorite place is called Spandex World. It's based in Colorado. They usually have free shipping. And I I have yet to not find something on that website. And they had, because they're a dance apparel and they're a gymnastics apparel um, company, they have all kinds of fabric, all kinds. So I love Spandex World. We think it's only stretch, but no, they have a lot. <laughs> I even purchase leather from them. <laughs> so, um, but when it comes to, um, foam or items like that, you might be a little bit more hard pressed in Arizona. You're probably going to have to order online. Um, there is a place called um, the Cosplay Pros based out of Happy Valley, and they sell um, cosplay foam. They sell foam clay. Um, so they just do offer those options. Um, and uh, Harbor Freight, I think that's a girl. Harbor Freight is good for anti-fatigue floor mats and for tools. Harbor Freight's really good for, for inexpensive tools, um, store or a lot of thrift stores, because a lot of people uh, when they're trying to get rid of things, sometimes it's just you just need to clean the object or you need to service it or maintenance it, and it's really easy. Like I had to replace one part on uh, uh, I had a like I had a former uh, sanding tool which was just in a big kind of place and uh, it worked. It was normally three hundred dollars. I got it for like thirty. Was it? Oh, it was in a sanding tool. It's my jigsaw. Yeah. 
It was just too heavy. <laughs> yes. So I used to do custom cost image commission. Sometimes I can be convinced. It depends on the project. Um, I almost exclusively make costumes for men. I don't like making costumes for women because I don't know a lot about curves. I'm really tall and not super curvy, like except for my hips. So I tend to make costumes more for men for commissions. But I do know a lot of people, like if you are looking for a custom cosplay commission, I know a lot of people who do, in fact, make them and I can connect you with them. Yes. Oh, that is so what inspired you to do? Um, so what inspired me? Uh, so about 10 years ago, I was almost 100 pounds per weight. And I uh, did not feel comfortable in my own body. And I had someone introduce me to Kamui Cosplay, who was a cosplayer based out of Germany. And I was so intrigued by the different materials she was making that I'm like, I want to try some of these materials out. So I bought a few of them, started testing them out. And the, I realized all the work I was putting into this was kind of a workout and it was starting to help me lose weight from the comfort in my body. So I actually started cosplay to learn to love myself again. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. So and and it's worked. <laughs> and then it and then it um it ate my life. <laughs> but that's okay. Um so I think we're at two o'clock now or three o'clock. Oh right then. Do you guys have any other questions I can answer? Okay, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna go around in a circle. I'll start with you. Yes. Like, but, but is it is it possible like because if, if there's like any way like say if we if there's like like any way to if we go back and and, and watch something? Like, like, yes. So class talk live. I'll put this up here. And if you look on YouTube, this is where you can watch it. Here's the rest of the shows on there. <laughs> what is that one of the one episode 152? This is 153. 153? Yeah. 153. This is episode number 153. We screen, we've been screening for almost three years now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think you had a question as well. I do. So, okay. uh, very broad question. I know it's unique to every piece or every prop. Over the years, I have collected them. First of all, hard to do. The point where I have to have like a storage unit. Right? Yeah. Costumes, props, anything. Do you have any tips on that storage? Because yes, like I want to hang it up so I can see it. I highly I recommend. That I okay. Yeah. yeah. You like, need to check out Kamui Cosplay. Yeah. Okay. So she actually ran into the same problem, and she created. Um, this really amazing display, and she ties it on YouTube. Okay. And it's essentially a series of wireframes on wall, and she zip ties everything up. But the way she reinforced it was brilliant. Okay, I'll definitely check out. I'm yeah. familiar with her. Yeah. I guess I've never seen that. Like, like oh, it's so cool. I've made too many costumes, and it's just like I don't even know what I have now. Yeah. Like, everything is just damp in the drawer. I also recommend if you're trying to do. Um, what I like to do is I buy um, tuxedo sleeves, like the, the, the for, for covering tuxedos or, or wedding dresses, the actual covers that zip up. Yeah. And I like to put my clothes in there and then I put a label on it saying this is this costume and these are the pieces in it. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Like yes. Okay. So, well, there's one question that I have. Okay. Uh, on your website, there's a lot of So that was actually a purchase costume. I can tell you how they made it though, because I actually know. Um, so all it is, is they took a piece of elastic and then they wrapped fabric around it. And in the back, you can't see, but it scrunches. So I just put it over my, like over my wig and then I hide it, use the hair to hide. It's essentially just a piece of gold vinyl. And then they've added tassels to it and they sewed the gold vinyl to that piece of elastic. Because the vinyl, if I have you said vinyl that you use like furniture vinyl, it's just gold furniture vinyl, that's it. Yeah, I love it. I uh, I have an uncle Ira costume too. I'm calling her Auntie Ira. <laughs> so, well, um, thank you guys. I'm gonna log out of you guys so I can talk to them. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye, guys. You can watch.